Hoop Heads Podcast is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Hello, Hoop Heads. This is Alan Stein Jr. My new book, Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best, will be available from all major book retailers on January 8th. Raise Your Game takes a rare peek behind the curtain and shows you what the top coaches and players in the game do during the unseen hours. I share their routines, rituals, and habits, as well as proven strategies that you can implement with your team immediately. If you want to maximize your coaching impact and influence, order your copy today at RaiseYourGameBook.com. We all get caught in a moment, and we got to win, and we got to win. You know, it's to the point, seventh grade coach, we got to win, man. We got to win. We got to go undefeated. No, you don't. You got to develop kids, and you got to make sure that they grow up. And that's where a high school coach or an AAU coach can really help kids. Tough love is a good thing. Telling the kid the truth is a good thing. If he shows up late to an AAU game or to practice, don't play him. And, and well, I'm hurting the kid. Well, okay, then play him. And then the kid gets recruited by and signed by North Carolina. You think he's going to be on time then? So then he's going to go and go to Carolina and be late and late and late, and he's gotten away with it. And then they're going to get rid of him. So you really did the kid a disservice. Coach John Shulman spent 24 years coaching in college at the highest level and has built a reputation of being a tireless worker during stops at East Tennessee State University, Tennessee Tech, Wofford College, and University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. John has over 500 career wins as a head and assistant coach. Shulman was the 17th men's basketball coach at University of Tennessee Chattanooga. He left his mark there by becoming the second winningest coach in UTC's history. Coach Shulman led the Mocs to two NCAA tournaments and four Southern Conference regular season championships. He recruited and coached 11 all-Southern Conference performers and sent over 50 players to the professional ranks. John was named Tennessee Coach of the Year after beating the University of Tennessee Volunteers and leading UTC to the NCAA tournament. His love for his players and outgoing personality helped make him an uncommon coach. During his 24 years of coaching, Shulman built relationships with the top coaches and management in the college and professional ranks. Shulman now uses those connections and relationships to help the clients of 720 Sports Group. John's love for athletics and passion for the game of basketball led him to start 720 Sports Group in order to help athletes and coaches fulfill their dreams and career goals. Your five-star rating and review helps other members of the basketball community find the Hoopheads podcast. We appreciate you being part of the audience as we look forward to a great year in 2019. You will definitely want to take some notes as you enjoy this episode with Coach John Shulman from 720 Sports Group. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome to the podcast Coach John Shulman. John, welcome. Well, I appreciate appreciate y'all having me on. Yeah, we're very excited to get on and dig into your coaching career and talk to you a little bit about some of the things that you've done in the basketball world. Very excited to dig into all that. We want to start, though, by going back in time to your childhood and talk a little bit about how you got into the game of basketball in the first place as a kid. You mean when I went to the store and got my first Chuck Taylors? There you go. There you go. I'm still wearing I'm still low top mine. Chuck Taylors, low top Chuck Taylor for about twenty five bucks, and I was so juiced up I couldn't even function. What color did you have? Oh, I had orange. That was at the third grade. Nice. See, we, we, I went to a very small. It wasn't because of the Tennessee Vols either. I'll just let me make sure you put that out there. Uh, but no, I went to a very small school. It was grades one through twelve was in one building, and so we had a little elementary basketball league. And uh, played on Saturday mornings. And those Saturday morning games were the most important games in the history of basketball. I would be so nervous. I'd get up about 6 in the morning. I'd put my stuff on. A game would be at 11 o'clock in the morning. And I'd have my my socks pulled up to my knees and my low-top Chuck Taylors and my uniform on. And that's where I fell in love with the game, um, just to be honest. I, I love the game. I love – you know, when you when you shoot it and that, that thing goes in, it was an unbelievable film. So I fell in love with basketball when I was in elementary school. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, when you're a kid and you get the chance to play with your buddies and you're in your neighborhood, I know one of the things I've talked to a couple other coaches about and one of the things that is no longer – it's not around as much as it was when you and I were kids, but we used to have, in my community, we used to have the uh, the high school players would coach 
the younger kids. And Thanks. that Thanks. was Thanks. something that I loved. Did you have that at your in, in your town? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was a big deal. It was a big deal to be coached by a varsity high school player because you thought those guys were gods. And so, and you couldn't wait till you were on the other end of it where you got to coach. And so, but it, it was about playing ball. It, was, it wasn't about playing Fortnite. It wasn't about, you know, I know people on this. I, we didn't have phones. We, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have, the video game of choice was Pong. All right. <laughs> exactly. And, and, that could keep your attention for about 28 seconds. And so what you did was you played ball and you, you, you didn't have trainers and you didn't have workout guys. You played ball and you played two on two and one on one and three. Like I, I try to convince my kids to, to just go to the gym and play one on one. And they look at me like I got four heads. <laughs> and, that's it's so true, John. It is so true. Go play one on one. That's where you learn how to play. If you want to learn how to get by somebody, play one on one for a Coke and, and see if you can get by somebody. Play one-on-one, -on -one, play two-on-two. -two. I think the greatest game in the history of mankind is three-on-three. -three. And and I was the I was probably the best coach in America at teaching shell. I could do anything out of shell. <laughs> we, just, I was a four-on-four national um, team coach. We, I could do it all. Uh, but then, you know, and then five-on-five, -five, but but nobody plays, you know, nobody plays pickup. We had a great game. This is a great game. We, we played a three-on-three -three game. We had, um, we did this six period at school and there were probably 40 to, to 50 guys in the gym. And, and the coach put us in three-on-three -three teams. So you had three guys. And so he set you against a wall, all right? So you sat with your team and you played to one basket. Three on three to one basket. If you lost, you had to go to the end of the line. You had to go sit on the end of the bench and sit on the other end of the, of the court. And then the next three would walk in there. And, and so you played three on three to one, and, and you talk about having to play hard because if you lost, you were sitting. And, and nowadays, if you lose, you, you, you get a trophy. No, I'm just kidding. Well, you, you, sit, you sit for an hour until you play your next game. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. And, and where are we going to eat? And, and so, <laughs> and so when, when we lost a game, there was a consequence. You didn't get back on the daggum court for for twenty minutes, and, and um, it was just back in the day. And, and you know, I don't want to be one of those old fashioned guys and old guys, but back in the day, it was a lot easier. I think it was a lot easier to be good back in the day because there wasn't anything else to take our mind off of it. How about that? Yeah, I agree with you. I, I grew up in the exact same way that you grew up, which is I'm just out on my driveway playing one-on-one, -on -one, playing two-on-two. -two. I tell people all the time, I used to play kids in my neighborhood, and we would play up to 100, you know, one-on-one -on -one to 100, scoring, oh, wow. by, score, scoring by ones. And the final score, almost inevitably, every game was 199. You know, and then you'd sit down, and you'd have a giant glass of lemonade, and you'd go and play again. And kids today just don't – they don't do that. And, I you know, I don't know – Again, from your perspective as as a college coach, how do you think that impacted the players that you had an opportunity to coach? Like, did you see that come out in terms of the competitiveness? What? How do How do you think it impacted a player? Let's say that you know went to college in 2015 as opposed to a player who went to college in 1985. Well, I don't think there were 778 transfers um, in 1985. Um, it, it was a different era, and and you, you didn't have you didn't have AAU, you didn't have the summer, and I think a lot of that is great. I think AAU is in a lot of ways is great. I think summer basketball is great. We didn't have that back then, but the problem is, you know, I, I'm one of those guys that think when when you commit to an AAU team um, March the first or March fifteenth, that that's your team you play on. And so if you get disenchanted with playing time and you want to leave, well, you're, you're out of the AAU circuit for that summer. <laughs> that, that'll make you want to stay on your team and, and pick the right team be, because you, you got to be seen. But there's, there's no consequence to anything. Back in the day, you know, it, if, you didn't, if you didn't get playing time as a freshman, you weren't expected to play as a freshman. It wasn't that you know, guys are leaving after one game. Um, I didn't. I didn't play a lot in that first game. I, I want to transfer. Uh, that's not teaching a whole lot to, to anybody. 
because uh, trust me, after those college games are over, you're going to run into some adversity along the way, and you just can't run away from it. But I, I think it's just different. I think it's a different era. I don't think it has to be, but I think we've kind of allowed it to be. And um, it, it was a lot of fun coaching back in the day. It's really, I think it's really difficult to coach nowadays. What do you think makes it more difficult? In what way would you describe it as being more difficult? Well, we didn't have social media back in the day. We didn't have we didn't have the pressures. I, I coached um, East Tennessee State in in ninety and ninety one, where we we East Tennessee, little old East Tennessee. We had good players. We had good enough players where we beat BYU on Sean Bradley's first game of his career. We beat Cincinnati that year. We beat Xavier. We beat NC State, um, Corciani, Fire and Ice, Corciani and Monroe. Uh, we got beat by Iowa in the NCAA tournament. The next year, we beat Arizona in the first round of the NCAA tournament. And we, we had we had really we had really good players. But I tell you what, we did we had we had seniors. We had juniors and seniors. Very few. That's why Tennessee's so good right now. They've got grown men. You know, a lot of these programs don't have grown men, and and that's why you can see like a like a grad transfer from Samford going to Arizona and being good because he's a 23-year-old kid playing against an 18-year-old McDonald's All-American, 23-year-old grown men beat 18-year-old kids. It's just, I mean, there's a couple freaks of nature out there. Uh, but it, it's just a different, you know, it, it's a different back in the day. Uh, I remember back in the day, you, you couldn't you couldn't find a score from the West Coast. You had to wait till you saw it in the newspaper. You know, now you're now you're following the score. Now you know everything, what everybody else is doing. You know everybody's dirty laundry. You know everything going on. If a kid doesn't play, he's going to tweet it out. Back in the day, you could keep things a little bit more quiet, and, and people really didn't care what was going on at, at Santa Barbara or Pepperdine or Maine or New Hampshire or Florida Gulf Coast or East Tennessee State. Now it's all out every second of the day. Do you think that ratchets up the pressure? I mean, obviously it ratchets up the pressure on coaches just because, you know, there's the 24-hour news cycle of criticism and just second-guessing. But I got to imagine, and this is one of the things that I have a hard time wrapping my head around as a former college player, is to have that access to you in terms of, you know, people sharing their opinion about how you played. Like when I had a bad game, I knew I had a bad game that hung that hung with me until the next game, but it only hung with me. It didn't hang with the 9,000 followers or the, you know, 10,000 followers that I had on Twitter or Instagram that were watching and, and making comments about how I was playing. And I, I don't know how I would have handled that uh, as a, as an 18 or 19 year old kid. I, I didn't handle it very good as a 37 year old first year head coach. And, and at that time, it wasn't Twitter, and it was um, it was message boards. Uh, I don't even know if they have a ton of message boards around anymore because everything's just you can just tweet it out immediately and let everybody see it. But it was message boards back in the day, and and everybody got on. And it's really easy to hide behind a code name or a nickname where nobody really knows you. And I can blast anybody. Um, and so I, I think it, it kind of went to message boards and now it's gone to, to Twitter and Instagram and, and um, you know, used to kind of college, college athletes were kind of off. Uh, they, 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 no one, you weren't really allowed to blast a college athlete and rip them uh, because he wasn't a pro. Nowadays, it's, it's, you can go all the way down to middle school. You, you can start blasting middle, middle school kids and he didn't pass it to me <laughs> and uh, it, 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 it has changed. I think it's really difficult to be in a spotlight and, and you better be thick skinned and you better be, you know, like, like King Rice is a buddy of mine. King Rice two years ago was a hero. I mean, he had won 27 games at Monmouth. Who does that? King Rice is a UNC guy and, and a legend and 27 wins. And, and now they're like, zero and 10 and he's on the hot seat. That's two years ago at Monmouth. You know, they don't – you're not allowed to fail anymore. You're not allowed as a head coach or a coach to, to have adversity. You're really not allowed to as a, as a player. It's – you know, if you're struggling as a player, you, you know, you're either on a downward swing or an upward swing. And same thing with coaching. I mean, if you lose two games, soon it's going to be like this. Uh, used to an NCAA tournament bid would buy you, you know, three to four years. Uh, now it's buying you three to four games. 
I mean, people, <laughs> yeah. people are blasting Porter Moser now. I mean, come on, man. The, the guy can't coach anymore. Are you kidding me? He is phenomenal. He just took Loyola to a Final Four, and now because they're, what, 5-5 five and five and lost to Furman, man, I mean, he must have, have absolutely forgotten how to coach. It's amazing how dumb he got that quick. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things that just always, I think, amazes me is people on the outside, whether it's media or just critics or whoever it is, that, you know, you realize when you're in the coaching profession how much your talent level on your team impacts the ultimate results of what you have and you can go from being a great coach one year when you have great talent and the next year your talent isn't quite as good and you can do a better job of coaching and well, have have far worse results simply because of the level of talent that you have I, I think it's talent but I also think it's chemistry I think it's I think it's luck I, I think you know Furman is 11 and0 ranked 23rd in the country they beat Western Carolina in double overtime they beat Gardner Webb in overtime. They, they were fortunate to beat Villanova and Loyola, but but you better be you better be fortunate. You better get a break here and there. You better get the, the ball bouncing your way. If Loyola if Loyola doesn't make a prayer against Tennessee, they don't get to a Final Four last in, in the NCAA tournament. So I think it's got to be a little luck. You know, I remember my first year as a head coach at Chattanooga. We went to the NCAA tournament. Uh, we had no injuries. I started the same starting five like the entire season. And then the next year, I, but you take that for granted. The next year we were hurt and banged up, and we had like 87 missed games. And I, I was, remember looking at Davidson's um, um, stat sheet, and they had like they had played 32 games, and they had the same lineup 32 times. And they had 32, they had five guys start 32 games. When you have that, you're really good. And, 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 but that is, you're lucky, you're fortunate. And especially, I know. I, listen, I got y'all got to hang in there with me because I got such ADD. It's ridiculous. But <laughs> but especially in in these days, because at, at, in in those days you couldn't practice in the summer. You know, everybody wants more access to your kids. All right, and everybody wants more access to your team, and, that, and that's great. But all of a sudden now you're you're practicing in June and July, and some in August, and then your your back school starts in August. Your your freshmen are hitting the wall now, not in January, but they're hitting the wall in like late November, and everybody's beat up and everybody's hurt and everybody's injured. Why? Because we are these kids are exhausted, and it didn't used to be like that. So I, I think the smart guys, um, you know, will take some time in the summer to to work on our guys, but not 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 kill them um, because you, you're going to see. You know, you're gonna see a lot of guys getting hurt, and and that's the luck of trying to stay healthy enough to have one of those special years. Yeah. So two things that you said there, John, that kind of jumped out at me. One is there is a huge difference in terms of the summer commitment. I know. Again, when I was playing, and I played Division One basketball at Kent State, and we our season would end, and you know we'd have some weight, we'd have some weight room work that we do in the spring, and then the summertime I went home. I mean, I was you know I was at home. I came back to school. You know, on campus the same time all the other students did, and now obviously that's completely changed. And I think, to your point, yeah, I mean, to your point, that's you know, I mean, that definitely can lead to to burnout. I know how much I love the game of basketball. I know there were times where you know practice definitely became a grind over the course of my four year career. I couldn't imagine having been on campus, not being able to go and play pickup basketball and all the things that I love to do in the summertime, just working on my game and you know playing on the playground and that kind of thing. Uh, to you know, to be in an organized setting all summer long, I think that would have worn on me. And I was a kid who couldn't get enough basketball, so that's definitely something that's got to be a huge adjustment. And the other thing you talked about is is team chemistry, and I think that's something that is critical to developing. A, you know, having having team success. It's amazing, as you know, I can think back to a number of seasons where I coached, and obviously I never coached the college level, but just on the high school level. You just never know. You never know about guys' personalities and who gets along and when a leader steps forward. And I'm sure you saw that all the time, you know, with your college programs. You know, some years it clicked and some years it didn't. It's it's the chemistry. Now, I think talent, you, you got to have talent. There is no doubt. Uh, and I think the higher level you go, uh, if Duke doesn't have Zahn and, and that crew, they're not going to be a top five team in the country. All right. But I think also I think talent is a little bit overrated in that, you know, what Rick Barnes has done 
they've got great chemistry. They got no four star, five star guys. They got guys that fit Rick Barnes and fit their program and fit their culture on what they want to do. And so I, I, I think, you know, and especially uh, like high school, I, I think talent's overrated. I, I think I think you get one of those talented guys and you bend over backwards and and you allow him to miss weights uh, on Tuesday morning and allow him to roll his shorts up while no one else's shorts are rolled up and allow him he's got different shoes on than everybody else because he plays for the Under Armour team in the summer. Uh, you're going to have you're going to have issues. Uh, I, I think a good team, you know, I think a good team is still. Uh, a lot more fun to coach than a bunch of prima donnas who are really talented. The other thing about that is it's amazing now what you'll do is sacrifice to win a basketball game. And I'm still trying to figure out why. And and I know winning is important, but nobody really remembers when we beat Greensboro and Fran McCaffrey in 2005 in a home game when Bobby Crimmins did the game on, on TV. Nobody remembers that Apparently now. you do. Apparently well, you do. I do because I'm a sick puppy. All right, <laughs> but but nobody else remembers that. And so, really, in theory, everybody kind of just you know, you, you better do what's right with your team. You better take care of your team. Um, it, it's it's a lot more fun. I'm telling you, and, and Mike, you know what I'm talking about. There's some teams that you have that winning's not even a whole lot of fun. And and th- if winning's not fun, then then you're probably doing something wrong. And, and the, the most fun I ever had coaching, all right, is, is we, had a bunch of, we had a bunch of tough dudes to coach one year. And, and uh, I'm not going to say names. We had a bunch of tough guys to coach. And all of a sudden we had, uh, we, we had a couple guys go down with the flu. And we had one of them was suspended. And, and all of a sudden we were down, we were down to six players, all right, two walk-ons and, and four scholarship guys. And we had to go play Western Carolina at Western Carolina. Larry Hunter, you're an Ohio guy. Larry Hunter was yeah. my favorite human alive. Yeah, All Larry right? Hunter was at Larry Hunter was at OU, and I was at when I was at Kent. So yeah, I mean, what, what a special special human he was. And and but we had to go play Larry Hunter Western Carolina at Western. Well, we didn't have enough players. We only had six guys, and so we called Western Carolina and said, "Listen, man, we we can't come. We only got six guys." And so the AD said, don't worry about it. We'll reschedule. Well, Larry Hunter is a competitive dude. Uh, hey, John, I don't – If you you got six guys. Yes, sir, Coach Hunter. Yes, sir. He went, all right, I'll, I'll, see, you, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> We're playing ball. And, <laughs> and so, and so I, and I understood that. And so we went over there with six players to play at Western Carolina, two walk-ons. And, oh, my God, was it a blast. We competed. We busted our tail ends. We got beat. Dean Smith's son called a reach in, like once again, sick puppy, me, called a reach in on a on a shot with point four seconds to go in a tie game on the road. We get beat on two free throws with point four seconds to go. And I remember going in the locker room, those kids were in tears, and I said, Now that was guys, that's what coaching's about. And and we didn't win that game, but that was coaching. Coaching is coaching. Coaching is not just about winning. It's it's coaching. Taking a bad team and being mediocre. That's coaching. Taking a mediocre team and being really good. Let me just tell you something. Coaching is not taking a bunch of talent and winning games. That's just a bunch of talent. Um, or, or t- you know, coaching can be taking a bunch of talent and not winning. Uh, that That's also coaching in the other direction. So what we got to remember is is coaching is about kids and trying to help kids and uh, but sometimes it's about about luck and sometimes about chemistry, but you can make your own. Rick Bird at Belmont does an amazing job with chemistry, because he doesn't take chances in recruiting, and and he gets kids that fit him. He gets fit, kids that fit Belmont and get fit, kids that fit his system. He doesn't just go with talent. He gets the right fit. And I know that's harder in high school. But if a high school guy doesn't want to do what he's supposed to do, and, and he's the most talented guy, I promise you he'll turn into a cancer. My dad died of cancer uh, 27 years ago, and cancer will will kill your team, and you know that. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think when you have somebody that doesn't fit what you want to do and somebody who wants extras or wants privileges or wants things that, you know, don't fit in with the rest of the team and with the culture that you're trying to build, in my experience, again, and I'm at a much lower level than you were able to attain as a coach, but I just found that those guys just end up contributing to losing as opposed to contributing to winning. And not only that, but they also you spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about them, dealing with them, trying to make it work. And inevitably it just, it just doesn't work. And it's not a good situation for anybody. Well, I got a question for you. All right. So how much fun was it when, when you have one of those kids, how much fun is it to go to practice every single day, not knowing if he's going to have an attitude, not knowing if his effort's going to be there, not knowing if he's going to be a pain in the tail with the other team. How much fun is that? I can answer that in one word. It's terrible. It is absolutely, so eliminate, it's absolutely terrible. Eliminate that guy. Eliminate. You know, you, you try to help him. No doubt. Try to help him. But, but we all are guilty of just trying to hang on because the kid's a good player. Eliminate him. You're going to have more fun and you'll win more. So let me ask you this. As a college coach, and you talk about, you know, building your culture and having good team chemistry, when you go out on the recruiting trail and you're looking at players, and obviously you have to match the talent to the level where you're coaching, but how much of that, how difficult is it to look at the player and figure out what are those intangible things that I want to have that I want to bring into my program. How difficult or easy was it to identify those kinds of kids that you wanted to be to bring into your program? Well, I, I think it's both. I think it's easy and it's difficult. It's difficult because you really can't tell. Now you can tell if a kid and you love that kid, and then all of a sudden he goes to the bench and and they have the next time out, and he's over there sitting over there sulking and pouting. That that ain't hard to find. That ain't hard. But once again, now. Uh, we, we'll make excuses, you know. Coaches make excuses all the time. Well, he got screwed. He should be playing anyway, or that was, a, or if he's getting a technical. Well, the official, listen, officials gonna make mistakes. I hate officials, but it's just, a, you know, I'm, <laughs> all right. But but how does he act with officials? Sometimes those guys can hide it. So talk to the high school coach. Talk to the AAU coach. Um, and that was always. Listen, I, I was the worst. I was the worst. I would talk to a high school coach, and a high school coach would say, don't take this kid. And I was like, but I can change them. I can change them. Well, you ain't changing them. And so if there's red flags pop up, you almost need, listen, it, you know, having talent is like being hooked on crack. And, and you, you got to have talent. You almost got to have a guy on your staff to say, hey, man, like a checks and balances. And say, listen, man, you we gotta don't. Have, you got to have a realist on staff, huh? Absolutely, every staff, every staff, and say, you, we don't need that guy, coach. We don't need. He is going to be a pain in your tail. And then you go, yeah, you're right. You're right. You you can't have a bunch of yes men on your on your coaching staff, and you can't. They cannot be in a, agreement all the time. And and you got to be able to have tough arguments. I mean, tough conversations. They may not, may end up as argument, but tough conversations um, <laughs> like that. But you know, you have to, you got to to listen to your gut. The other thing is your gut. My gut would always say, come on, man, don't, you, you got to get rid of them or this or that. And, and, and sometimes it's very difficult because you got the media you got to deal with and you got the kids you got to deal with. And, um, but it, it's really most of the time, if you get rid of the, the, the cancer, uh, the body lives. And if you get rid of the cancer on your team, your team will have, the greatest practices of the season the next couple days and they will have a blast because once again let's say you win uh, you got rid of the cancer and you win three of the next nine games well in 12 years they're not going to remember any of that they're going to remember that they had a great experience and that's what we can't forget but we all get caught in a moment and we got to win and we got to win you know it's to the point seventh grade coach we got to win man we got to win we got to go undefeated no you don't you got to develop kids and you got to make sure that they grow up. And that's where a high school coach or an AAU coach uh, can really help kids. Tough love is a good thing. Telling the kid the truth is a good thing. Uh, making sure, I don't care if a college coach is out, to, you, you may, if he's showing up late, if he shows up late uh, to an AAU game or to practice, don't play him. 
and well, I'm hurting a kid. Well, okay, then play them. And then the kid gets recruited by and signed by North Carolina. You think he's going to be on time then? So then he's going to go and go to Carolina and be late and late and late, and he's gotten away with it, and then they're going to get rid of him. So you really did the kid a disservice. Yeah, I think that's something that a lot of people – have sort of a you know they look at it the, from the wrong viewpoint and I think you did a really good job there of describing it where you're know, like oh I don't want to you know I don't want to bench him I don't want to sit him out I don't want to you know I don't want to make him angry I don't you know he's a really good player he's talented and in the reality in the long run you're doing that kid a huge disservice because eventually they're going to get somewhere whether it's to you know a college program or maybe they got a you know opportunity to play overseas or somewhere where that stuff's just going to come back to bite them and it's not going to be tolerated and I see that all the time in schools as a teacher uh, you know you, you have to hold kids to a standard and hold them accountable and when you don't you're not doing them any favors in the long run because eventually whether it's again in the basketball world or another sport or it's in their real world job that they end up in they're just th- those opportunities just aren't there and, and you have to make sure that you're conveying those life lessons to your kids and your players because if you don't, you're just you're shortchanging them. Absolutely, and we, we've all we've all been there where we didn't handle a situation right, and and we're making sacrifices to try to win a game. You don't sleep very good at night. You, you don't sleep at night, and we, you know, those Rick Bird sleeps good every single night. There is no doubt at Belmont, Rick Bird is sleeping really good every single night. I, I'll let me tell you this story, Farad Cobb. You know that name. No, Farad no. Cobb, Farad Cobb played at Cincinnati a couple years ago, all right? And he was a good little guard, played at Cincinnati uh, for Mick Cronin and, and Larry Davis. And um, he had a couple NBA looks. He got invited to a couple of – Farad Cobb started with me at Chattanooga. And he literally – he went to a very small high school. Um, he probably did pretty much what he wanted to do. He came to Chattanooga, so talented. Um, the kid made six threes in the first half at Kansas uh, when he was a freshman, and we led at half by eight. I mean, the kid was really talented, but he didn't he didn't know how to conduct his business, and he was driving me crazy. <laughs> and with five games to go in the season, I got rid of Farad. And I said, Farad, I want you to finish up strong uh, academically so you can go somewhere. But this isn't going to work because we have different beliefs and uh, it's time for you to go. Uh, Farad went to junior college, cleaned up his act, had a great year at junior college, ended up at Cincinnati. And later on, he said, the best thing that ever happened to me was getting kicked off the team at Chattanooga. Nobody ever, ever held me accountable to my actions. And so the kid grew up and he's doing, he's doing, he's having a good career now. But that's what... If it would really do everybody a huge favor if the Y coach or the sixth grade coach or the seventh grade coach or the eighth grade coach would do that. Because if the middle school coaches would hold kids accountable, then the JV coach would be thrilled and he wouldn't have to do it. But they don't do it, so now the JV coach got to do it. And if the JV coach would do it, then the then the high school coach, he's in great shape. But it doesn't happen because the JV coach doesn't do it. Now it gets to the high school coach. And then if he doesn't do it, it it's going to pop its head. It's going to show up sometime. So wouldn't you, rather, wouldn't you rather take care of that mess in the seventh grade instead of when they're a sophomore in college and then they have to transfer or get kicked out of a program? Absolutely. In your opinion, what's the? Why do you think that is? Why do you think that at these younger levels, why do you think that that doesn't happen as much as it should? Is it because a lot of the coaches at the youth level and you know the middle school level maybe aren't as experienced of coaching? They don't have as much training. What What do you think it is uh, that that causes that to happen? All right. Let me ask you this: You ever been to a Y? You ever been to like a Saturday morning Y league? Yes, I have. All right. Who are the most? Who are the happiest people when they leave at noon on Saturday morning? The happiest people are the kids. Well, besides that, who are the happiest adults? The happiest adult. The happiest are the adults co- are the people who win. Who win? And so, if I'm a coach and I win, if I'm a, if I am a lawyer in town in Chattanooga, and and then I can go every Saturday morning, and and we dominate play, and I got a bunch of fools, but I dominate play because I got more talent. Than, than everybody else does. 
then let me just, at that dinner party that night. Oh my God, are you kidding me? Hey man, we are eleven and zero. We beat this team by forty two points. Hey coach. Hey Frank, you had nothing to do with that. <laughs> so, so don't think you did had anything to do with that. You see those kids on Saturday morning, and that's the only time you have better players than everybody else. And so that that's what happens is winning gets in the way of everything. And they can't help it. Soon there's going to be message boards for the Y League at, at the uh, e, at the Hamilton Place Y in Chattanooga, but it, it's going down earlier and earlier. And you know, I had a I did a little podcast the other day with Paul Biancardi. Um, you know, kids are worried about their college recruitment in the in like the sixth grade. And I mean, they're, they're worried about, you know, I need to be seen now. I, I, how am I getting exposure? I'm in the seventh grade. I'm, you know, I, it's, it's completely out of control. Yeah. I see. It's amazing. Like we have here in the Cleveland area, like I'll see, I'll see advertisements for, you know, the showcase for kids in grades three through eight. And I, 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 I read these and I'm like, what, what third grader is, being showcased because I know I'm sure when you were at Tennessee Chattanooga, you spent a lot of time out on the road catching those third grade games, seeing oh, who man, you were, we seeing who you were gonna, seeing who you were gonna recruit in. Absolutely, we went to those nine and under tournaments all the time because we had to get <laughs> jump start on that. Uh, but but here's the problem. Here's the problem, Mike. All right, so so we're at that same dinner party on Saturday night with Frank, okay? And 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 Frank Frank says, "Hey man, my my boy had a great." showcase today and i go what, what are you talking about uh well my boy went to the third grade showcase over there at cleveland state and there was a couple there were a couple scouting service and recruiting services over there well then i feel guilty because i've screwed my boy so so i'm going oh man i'm, I'm getting behind oh my god i've got a third grader who's not getting seen by a recruiting service oh my god i gotta get them to the next one when's the next one and so everybody, you know, as parents, what we all want, I've got three boys. We're, we're all just trying to do the best thing we can do for our boys. And now it's completely out of control. We got to, I mean, I got to hurry up and get my boy seen because Frank's boy is getting seen. And now his boy's getting a leg up on my boy. And now we're all completely whacked out of our minds. Yeah, one thing I I I saw last year was I, I coached seventh grade boys and girls, but um I, last year I had a parent that taped all our games and would upload them to Huddle. So then the ki- all the kids are like, oh, we have Huddle accounts, so let's upload our stats. And I mean, I'm coaching a team in in seventh grade boys in Olmstead Falls, and we were the we were the B, the quote unquote B team, but these kids wanted to upload their videos because you know they got to let their AU coaches know how they're playing and and they got to recruit themselves to these AU teams for tryouts and stuff and I'm like sitting here thinking you guys realize like it's not that big of a deal this is you know we're, we're trying to make you better basketball players here and like they were so concerned with all their stats and things it's it's just crazy how much stress and pressure is that for a seventh grade kid and mm-hmm. and you know and I got to get on the right AAU team and y'all get better shoes than we do and and oh man, and they, I mean, it, it's so much pressure, but I don't know if the parent, if we're putting on that pressure or the kids are, are feeling so, but it, like, I, I've got a, I've got a seventh grader and, and this seventh grader is not like my first seventh grader. Uh, this one is like 19 years old and, and he acts like he's 19 and, and the other one acted like a seventh grader, but everything gets sped up. And, and we, we make these kids, we just need to let seventh graders be seventh graders and sixth graders be, it used to be such an easy life. I remember being outside of my house, working on my game, pretending Dean Smith was up there watching me work out. And, and that's how I worked out. I, I, I just wanted to play. I just wanted to play. Now, um, uh, some parents are probably trying to figure out a, a way to get Roy Williams actually to their house to watch <laughs> yeah. they play. Instead of imaginary, they, they want the kid there. And um, it's just, I feel bad. I, I, you know, I feel bad for the kids. I feel bad for the parents. I feel we just need to slow down. But it ain't slowing down. It ain't going to slow down. It's going to. You know, it's going to be interesting that the new rules, the NCAA rules on on AAU tournaments and and how many kids can get seen now. It's going to be interesting. It's going to take two or three years to kind of um, figure out kind of how this thing is going to work uh, NCAA wise too. 
Yeah, do you think there's a way that we can educate as a basketball community? Is there a way to educate youth basketball parents and middle school basketball parents and high school basketball parents and make them more aware of the process of what how what really goes on and what's really important when it comes to college recruiting and then I think the other thing that is a huge piece of it is that people have no idea how good you have to be to play at any level in college basketball, like you hear people at my son's in seventh grade too. And I, you know, you hear people, we go to tournaments and you know, you hear people about, Oh, they're on this team and they're on that team and they're playing, you know, we're traveling to this state and we're going here and you know, they're going to be this and that. And I'm like, you know, your kid hasn't even hit puberty yet. How do you have any idea <laughs> what they're, you know, how do you have any idea what they're going to be? And I just, every time I come back and I have this discussion with anybody, it, to me, it always comes down to how do we educate parents and make them more aware of what the process is so that they can make intelligent decisions about who, what program they play with and what coach they're with so that they're getting more out of it than just this pipe dream of my kid's going to get a division one scholarship at the end of this rainbow. Well, I think you can educate. I think you, we can educate them, but then there's still going to be people that really is kind of like the school that don't want to be educated. Okay. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah, I think we ought to do that. I think everybody needs to chill out. And then they go back home and, and, and get on. That's good. Everybody else is chilled out. Now I'm going to go get a leg up on somebody because I'm going to go. I'm going to be the one person to get to that showcase. And so I, I think you can educate, but there's always going to be people that don't want to be educated, that think they know. Listen, I mean, I, I've coached for 32 years. If I went out and coached a seventh grade basketball team right now, Trust me, eight of them would already know way more than I know. And that's another thing. I might let me ask you this. How many times I don't understand why fans and people, everybody let let me ask something. Do you know how to do heart surgery? I do not know how to do heart surgery. If I was doing heart surgery on either you or Jason, okay, uh, do you, you'd be dead. Do you take a wisdom tooth out? I can't do that either. I watched ER. Does that count? <laughs> I watched <laughs> ER, Grace and Enemy once or twice. That doesn't count. Uh, how about financial planning? Do you know how to do it like really oh, in depth? Oh, 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 you're, oh no, see, see, you're actually you're actually asking the wrong guy because believe it or not, about five years ago, I went back to school and I was, right. and I was going to change and I passed the CFP exam. All right, there you go. So you are a smart guy. But here's what I want to know: How come everybody? And every fan and every parent think they can coach and they know the game. Well, That's I, what I don't understand. So, so we what, don't go into a doctor's office and say, man, what are you doing? Don't stick the needle there. That's stupid. That's crazy. Well, <laughs> but, but everybody comes to a game and everybody knows more than the coach. I, I, and I, and I, I don't I – don't, that, that has always drove me absolutely crazy. And I, parents, just to be honest, parents drive me crazy. And I, I used to tell this story to – to all my parents when I actually I coached in high school. You know those parents that come to the game and, and their kid gets the ball and they yell, shoot. You know, shoot it, shoot it. You mean all the parents? Yes. <laughs> well, I, so I told my parents, I coached at Macaulay, all boys private school for the last four years. And I was like, listen, don't come to the day, game and, and tell your son to shoot it. Because I may have told him not to shoot it, or I, we may be running a set where we're, we're trying to throw the ball inside, or we're looking at this. And if you tell him to shoot it, and I've already told him not to shoot it, what's your kid supposed to do? And all you're doing is screwing them up and mixing them up. So just, you know, if you can ever find a coach that you trust, just leave them alone. Completely leave them alone and just cheer for them and be supportive of them. Uh, but getting back to level, let, let me just tell you this. My, my oldest my oldest is playing at, at Alabama Huntsville, UAH, for Lenny Acuff. Um, they're 6-2. and two, They're Division II. Um, they, they, Lincoln Memorial's in that league. Finley's, in, I mean, in that division. Finley and, and Queens. Uh, half those teams, the top 25 teams um, could go into lower level Division One conferences and finish upper upper tier in their leagues, without a doubt. Uh, you can find pros playing NAIA. You can find pros playing uh, junior college basketball. You can find pros. Oh my gosh, yes, you can find pros playing Division Three basketball. It was the Robinson kid at Michigan last year? Big white kid who really shoots it. Didn't he come from Williams? Yes. 
Uh, well, last time I checked, Williams. Last time I checked, I don't see a lot of Division One schools wanting to play Williams. You know why? Because Williams is better than a lot of those lower level Division One schools. So it can't be, uh, you know, I, I got to play Division One. I. I, you know, I asked my son as as he was coming out, and this is no offense to any basketball program, but but he had, you know, we 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 live about an hour and forty five minutes away from UAH. UAH um, averages about seventeen hundred fans a game. Their lower level of their um, gym is is sold out. Uh, they average probably more than probably 100 to 125 Division One programs in the country. And I asked him, I said, L- let me ask you this. I said, you go to a prep school and you come out of prep school and you got an opportunity to go to, to Maine, to Grand Canyon, to San Jose State, and North Dakota State. Or you can go to UAH, Division Two. Where are you going to go? And he said, I'm going to go to UAH because it fits me. I want to be close to home, and it fits me academically, and it fits me with their, how they play, their style of play. Well, that's a pretty mature statement for a, for a kid. It's about fit. If it, if it, the problem is no, no kid, they just want to play Division One basketball. That's why we have 800 transfers every year. And so it, it's, it's, we're really screwed up. We're really screwed up. We don't, we don't publicize – D3 guys enough. If you're playing, if you're going, if you're at a high school, okay, if you're at a high school and you got a kid going to San Jose State and you got a kid going to Williams and you got a kid going to Queens, that's Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three. Every single one of them should be celebrated. Not just the one going to San Jose State. Every one of those guys should be celebrated because just to have an opportunity to play college basketball is a gift and a privilege for everybody involved yeah for any kid who loves the game just the opportunity to continue to play you know you and i both know and you know sometimes you don't have that perspective when you're 16 years old that that ball is going to stop bouncing probably a lot sooner than you want it to and to just be able to have an opportunity to continue to play if you love basketball no matter what the level and to your point you've got to find the right school the right fit both from a basketball standpoint, but also from an academic and social standpoint. I think that's really, really important. And when you don't, you know, you'll find, again, kids get to a school and you mentioned earlier, you know, they don't play in the first game or they don't play in the first six games or they, they're not getting as many minutes as they think they should. And then all of a sudden, you know, their AAU coach or their dad or their uncle or somebody's whispering in their ear saying, Oh, you know, this coach is sticking it to you. And, Oh, you know, why don't you, you know, whereas, Again, like I look at it as when you come in from the col- from from high school, unless you're an unbelievable McDonald's All American, and even then, some of those guys get to college and they it's an adjustment. And so, for the average high school player who gets an opportunity to play at whatever level of college basketball, it's an adjustment, and you better be ready to sit on the bench for a little bit and pay your dues and figure it out. And too many guys want it right away, and then that leads to again all the transfers that you've already talked about. Let's take a quick break and hear from our sponsor, Alan Stein Jr. Hello, Hoop Heads. This is Alan Stein Jr. My new book, Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best, will be available from all major book retailers on January 8th. Raise Your Game takes a rare peek behind the curtain and shows you what the top coaches and players in the game do during the unseen hours. I share their routines, rituals, and habits, as well as proven strategies that you can implement with your team immediately. If you want to maximize your coaching impact and influence, order your copy today at raiseyourgamebook.com. Well, we, we talked about we talked about this. So, so Macaulay is a great school that we got a, there's a rival across town, um, Baylor. Uh, they hate each other. They're two big time schools or great schools and they hate each other. All right. So when they play each other in, in football, in basketball, in baseball, in bowling, they could play checkers against each other and there'd be 5,000 people at that deal. All right. And so it's a huge deal. So, I, you know, I asked, including my kids, I said, I said, you know, I said, Baylor Macaulay, that's a big deal, isn't it? Oh, Dad, it's the biggest game in the in the history of mankind. It, I mean, it's huge when Baylor Macaulay. I said, I hate to tell you this because everybody outside of Baylor Macaulay could give a rip 
about the Baylor Macaulay game. Nobody cares. As long as you got so so you know uh, up up in Ohio, up in South Dakota, there are two rival schools that that are playing that think it's the biggest game in the history of mankind. Which if you're involved, if you have a uniform, you have officials, you got a scoreboard, then it should be the biggest game. Make the big time wherever you are. And so, I mean, when Williams plays Amherst up in Mass, that's a huge game. When Kentucky plays Louisville, that's a huge game. And so, when when Texas Permian Basin plays um, whatever Division Two down in Texas, that's a huge game. So it doesn't matter wherever you are, that's the big time. Why? Because that's where you are. Yeah, to your point, nobody outside of those games really cares. Nobody remembers those games. You know, they, it's, they don't care. Y'all don't no. care. Do y'all care about Baylor McCauley up there? No, could care less. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't even know Baylor McCauley was a school until you said it, to be completely there honest. You go. And, and so that's what I'm trying to say. It doesn't, you know, uh, we got a really some really high level Division three schools around here. Emory in Atlanta is a big time program. Barry, Sewanee, Rhodes, um, Birmingham Southern. When those people play, it is war. When Carson Newman plays Queens, it's war. Y'all never even heard of these people. I, t- uh, you know, it, it's funny. Uh, I'll never forget. Uh, I was so stressed out. We're getting ready to play Wake Forest and Chris Paul in the NCAA tournament. Uh, we're up in Cleveland where I'm freaking out. This is, I mean, I'm a first year head coach going against Skip Prosser. I'm Chris Paul. And I'm, and, and I said, this is the biggest thing in the history of mankind. All right. And so that we got on the bus to go to the game and, and a lady bus driver was taking us over there. And, and she was like, you know, what are y'all doing here in town? She was like, I know I'm supposed to take you over to the, to Cleveland state. What are y'all doing? I said, well, ma'am, it's, it's the NCAA tournament, and it, you know it's a, it's it's a pretty big deal. And she was like, "Okay, well, great." So she pulls up and she sees all the CBS trucks uh, out there. She was like, "Wow, th- this must be a big deal." I was like, "Yes, ma'am. It, you know, it's a big deal." She was like, "Who y'all playing?" I said, "Wake Forest," and she said, uh, "She said, oh, Lake Forest. That's they've got a really good good school, Division Two. That's a good school. People don't <laughs> care, man." <laughs> People, You're right. I'm telling you, man, people don't care. We make this out. I'm blessed to receive an offer from this division. One. People don't care. They, we think they do, and we got to put it on Twitter. We got to put it on Instagram. People don't care. We're completely out of whack. We just need to go where it fits us, uh, where where we feel good about ourselves, because that's the problem. You know, these guys are going Division One, and they're going to a place that doesn't fit them. And then all of a sudden, they don't play, and they don't they don't feel good about themselves. And then guys are screwing around academically. Go to the place that fits you and that you're happy. Happy, you know. I think Valvano used to talk about, you know, happy is, you know, why? Are you, how are you successful? You're successful if you're happy. Don't mess with happy. If you're happy, be happy. Yeah, I think that's a great way of looking at things from. And it's sometimes hard to keep that perspective as a player, as a coach, you know, just like you described. You get so caught up in your little corner of the world. And again, it's the only corner of the world you live in, so it better be important to you. But by the same token, nobody else outside of that cares. And I always use the sort of use this statement of, well, you know, here I am playing this game, but there's a billion people in China that have never heard of the, never heard of me, never heard of this game, don't, don't know anything about it, and aren't going to care what the result is. So just play and have fun and enjoy yourself and work as hard as you can and try to be the best that you can possibly be. And I think if you can keep that perspective, it really helps. And, of course, again, to your point, when you're coaching at Tennessee Chattanooga, there's pressure. There's pressure to win. And you're, you're in your world, you've got to produce and, and show results. And if you don't, you know, the university or your boss or whatever is going to show you the door. And you just got to have to be able to keep things in perspective and make sure that you're coaching for the right reasons and really go back and, again, look at your why. Why am I doing this? What's the ultimate reason why I want to coach basketball? You know, it, you, you start with that. That's the whole key, Mike. The whole key is however you start it is how you need to finish it. All right, but that's where it gets really hard. Most of the people that that are in coaching uh, did not get into coaching uh, to make two and a half million dollars a year. They they got into coaching because they love kids, they love the game, and and they wanted to coach. 
the money came later on the money came with it later on but then you gotta you gotta continue doing what why you got in coaching now some people get in coaching to 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 get to the highest level and make a ton of money uh those guys will be on the fbi uh wanted uh the the watch list here soon <laughs> all right but you got to remember why you got into coaching because you you love the game you love the kids and if you can can remember the why part then then you're in great shape i remember so i worked for jeff lebo who was a carolina legend and i got a chance to go over there and and um go to the carolina coaches deal and and you walk in coach smith's office he had a huge board of of families it was all of his former players with their families and and i don't think people really realize and you know in another five years people aren't even going to remember who dean smith was on uh, the dean dome what is that why well dean smith was you talk about staying true to who he was he was i mean you talk about he was a family guy and family always came first and um i, I think we're kind of missing that now and and the pressures are different now there's no doubt the pressures are different and you know if if you you, that's why you got to win and get out and move and 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 it's too bad because you're not going to see the Bayhams of the world, the Rick Birds of the world, who stay at a place for for 25 years. Um, it's fan fatigue. Um, fans get tired of the same coach being there, and they need excitement and they need instant gratification. And it's it's just a tough time. And uh, we need to be more stable now because kids need uh, kids need that now more than ever and now we're in a flux all the time how did you go about building the relationships with your players as a coach obviously you just talked about dean smith and how important you know that carolina family was to him when he was coaching there and so in in the course of your career what were some of the things that you did or some of the ways that you went about building the relationships with your players so that you know 15 20 years down the line when those guys call you up and say, "Hey, coach," you know they they're telling you about their their marriage or their new job or their you know the successes that their kids are having. How do you go about building that type of relationship as a college coach with your players? Well, I, okay, so so I, I work for Lebo. I, I work for Jeff, and Jeff and I are still really good friends. But but we're and we're very different. Um, I, I've I've got this big personality. I love people, and and um, I remember taking over at Chattanooga. And, and I wanted to, um, I had an assistant, Dave Conradi, and I said, I said, you know, I want to, I want to bring the kids, I want to bring all the players up, up to the house, but, you know, I, we, we've never really done that before. And I said, is that, is that a bad idea? He said, no, it's a great idea. And I, I said, why? He said, because your, you know, your players need to see you as a dad and as a husband. And if they don't, they don't ever get to see that. They don't ever get to see that side of you. And so I, I think, number one, you know, I'm a family guy. I think you have to include your family. You know, I, I'm i sorry, but I, I mean, I took my boys. I took my boys on trips with us. I wanted, the, I wanted our players to see me as a dad and as a husband and that I wasn't this jet, that jerk that was coaching them for three hours every single day and yelling and screaming. They needed to see me like that. I needed them to see me like that. And and that's where they kind of learn how to be a husband, how to be, I mean, how else are they gonna learn? Maybe they came from a family that had that, maybe they didn't. But relationships, you know, either that's important to you, and I'm just gonna be honest with you, <laughs> um, early in my career, I was a relationship guy. And, and my first year, my first year as a head coach, those kids, oh my God, did I love them. I love them, we were very close. Um, and you know what's weird about that? Um, winning and losing was important, but those relationships were more important. And you know what we accidentally did? We accidentally won. And uh, we, we won the regular season, we won, we beat Tennessee at Tennessee. I helped Bruce Pearl get that job. Uh, we, we go to the NCAA tournament. And uh, we lead Wake Forest at half by three. The more pressure gets there, then you forget your why. And and by the end of my tenure at Chattanooga, my why was we got to win games. It wasn't about relationships. We got to win games. So I lost my why. So that's why I can talk about it because I lost it. 
and I lost my why and I lost the relationships. And you know what's weird? When you lose the relationships, you lose games. It's about relationships. It's about caring for those kids. If they, you know, uh, what they don't, they don't care what you know until they know how much you care. Uh, if you don't show them how much you care and you love them, they're not going to play for you. They're not going to box out on that weak side on that shot goes up. They're not going to box out on that weak side if they don't think you care for them. They will screw you, and they should screw you. You better show them that you love them and you care for them because you're there to help them with life and basketball and their academic. You're there to prepare them to be a man in college. In high school, you're there. You're, there, you're really there to prepare them for college. In, in, in college, you're there, you're there to prepare them for, for real life. And that's, ser that's serious stuff. And I, I, think, I think we absolutely fail in high school and we absolutely fail in college preparing men uh, for real life and for college. How can, I, we, how can we do that better? Like, what are some thoughts that you have on that? That we, how could we, how could we go about incorporating more of those, uh, for lack of a better term, life lessons into what we do on a daily basis as high school or college coaches? Okay, so what's more important in college? Well, I'm just curious. What's more important in college? Winning, winning a championship, going to the NCAA tournament, or helping these young men become better men? All right. So, I mean, ask your alum, ask your boosters. They don't care. They want to go to the NCAA tournament. They want to see their name on, on, on CBS. And so you're going to have to be, you know, so what's the AD want? AD's, AD's there to bring in money. And so you got to bring in money. You're not going to bring in money by having a great graduation rate. You're not going to bring in money. If you can do, here's the deal. When you have power, like Bob Ritchie at Furman does a great job of getting his guys involved in the community. Um, they, they each, each one of their kids have, has a tailored suit. Um, they do an etiquette class. They do all this stuff. All right. I mean, he really spends a lot of time doing all this other stuff off the floor. It's a pain to tell, and he does it. Let me ask you this. Is Furman having a pretty good year this year? Yes, they're 11-0, and, and they're ranked 23rd in America. Furman. Do y'all know where Furman even is? I'm just curious. It's in South Carolina. Where? What city? Uh, you got me on that one. I was Come happy, on. I, I, was happy I'll, I got the state I'll just, right. Let me just take a guess. I'll say Charleston. Absolutely not. All right, so it's Greenville. So you got... <laughs> You've got a school that you don't even know where it's at. It's ranked 23rd in the country. And all the coach down there is fooling around with is, is getting a suit for the uh, – they, they bring in business guys to, to, to conduct interviews with those kids, you know, etiquette classes. So really what we need to be doing is doing more with our kids and focusing more on the stuff out off the court. And I promise you – you will reap the benefits on the court, but but we can't think. I mean, it's it's such a quick fix world, and it's such a uh, instant gratification. We we don't think about that. You take over a program. Your first thing you should do is get to know your kids, man. Get to know your kids. Love 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 your kids. Get to know them. Introduce your family to them. Go meet their families and find out what makes them tick and find out what makes them go and find out what their career goals. I like I said, now I'm not I'm not claiming sitting here saying I'm the king. I lost my way. And when I lost my way, for whatever reason, we lost every tight game. All right. Well, maybe if I spent a little bit more time with relationship building and figuring that instead of worrying about my contract, maybe we would have won those tight games because we did early in my career when I was just focused on relationships. I think it's the number one. And, and let's say you focus on relationships, okay, and you focus on building better men, and then after five years they fire you. Well, that means you've done what's right in the game and you've done what's right with other humans for five years. So good for you because you changed a lot of guys' lives, and they will appreciate it because, trust me, they're not in in ten years. They're not going to remember those games anyway. They could care less about the games. Yeah, you're 100 percent right on that. I think if I look back on my own college career, like people always ask me, it's funny. I'll have kids that I went to school with, and they'll say, "Hey, do you remember that game you guys played against, you know, Ohio University when you were a junior?" And I'm like, "No, don't really remember. I played them, you know, ten times over the course of my career." 
you know, I might remember one, you know, I might remember one singular moment from a game, but I don't remember. You remember your teammates. You remember what it was like playing for your coach. You remember the road trips. You remember those things. And you don't necessarily remember what at the time in your mind you thought was the most important thing, which was the wins and losses. It really comes down to you remember the relationships. You remember the the team bonding. You remember being together with your teammates. And that's really what ultimately it comes down to it, it it all goes back to the relationships it really does well it, it, everything does and and we lose I, i'm telling you I, and and i can i can say it honestly i i lost my way with those relationships and i'm the king of relationships mike me and you don't even know each other me and you are like blood brothers that's right and so and so i'm the king of relationships and when i lost my way um, I was not even close to being the coach. You know, the guy X and O's, I tell you who's a, um, a big time coach. And, and I, and I blast him all the time. I bust his tail in, but, but Bobby Crimmins was a great basketball coach who was not an X and O guy. He was just a relationship guy. And, and it was really important that he, the, he knew those kids and those kids knew that he cared for them. Um, and let me just tell you something. They, those guys played really, really hard for that man. In relationship, it's just not telling them you love them and kissing their tail. Who is your best teacher? Go back to your best teacher in the third grade or, or your favorite teacher in elementary school. Most of those times you remember, those teachers, the ones that you remember are the ones that were hardest on you. Now, that doesn't mean they didn't love you. They were just hard. They, if they're hard on you and they expect and demand a lot, you know what that means? That means they love you. That means they care for you. That means they want the best for you. The people who don't prepare a lesson plan, they don't give a rip about you. The people that roll the balls out and don't and don't worry about practice and don't worry about boxing out and don't worry about setting a screen the proper way or don't worry about teaching how to diagram a sentence in English, they don't give a rip about you. They're cheating you. And, and kids uh, don't – you know it's tough they shouldn't be have to put up with it but they do and they enjoy it because hey man my english teacher we don't do anything in english <laughs> how about that well that's stupid they're screwing you and so you know you look back now miss bogart third grade whew, she was tough on me and i know she loved me and i appreciate it now i didn't appreciate it then but i do now yeah it goes back to what you said earlier about holding somebody accountable and when you hold somebody accountable, then that's a way of demonstrating that you care about them. You care about what they're doing in the moment. You care about what their future is. And when you don't hold someone accountable, you know, you don't care. You just, you just, you just don't care. And I think that's one of the things that whether you're a basketball coach or I, I look at this a lot of times from a perspective of a teacher and, you know, there's a lot of, you know, movement around the country of, you know, evaluating teachers on standardized testing and all this stuff. And, you know, coaches is sort of well, the same way. Such a great idea, by the way. And, but it's, it's, you know, we have, we, we evaluate teachers based on these test scores. And yet to your point, the teachers that you remember and your third grade teacher, you remember her because of the relationship she built with you. You don't remember her because she taught you how to spell or because, you know, you learned the capitals of all 50 States or whatever it was. And the content was irrelevant. What, made her the best teacher was the fact that she took the time to put her arm around you and show that you care, show her that, you know, show you that she cared. And that's the same way as a coach. If you're just, if you're just in that transactional mode where you're just trying to extract something from your players or your students, you're never going to have the kind of success and, and the, or the kind of meaningful success that anyone would want to have. The, the, the winds is shallow and when you're on your deathbed, when you're on your deathbed, you're not going to wish you had won two more state championships. I ain't going to lie to you. When you're on your deathbed, oh my gosh, why did we, why didn't we recruit that guy? It, it has nothing to do with that. So just pretend you're on your deathbed and then coach how you'd want to coach. Love those kids, love those kids, care for them. You know, when you rip a kid, you know what you need to almost say to them? Hey, listen, man, uh, you were late for practice. Uh, and, and we play the biggest game of our season, and I love you, and that's why I'm going to sit you out in the first half because I love you and I care for you so you don't do this when you get to college and you lose your scholarship because I let you play the first half right here. You're not going to learn any lesson, 
and then you're going to go to college and you're going to do the same thing and then you're going to lose your scholarship and and i'm going to feel bad so because i love you i'm going to do this for you when you do and then, that when you do that it just i think again too many coaches don't give that explanation sometimes along with the discipline that they you know that they hand out and i think if you can hand out the discipline and also hand out the why yeah. i think you i think as a coach you're going to end up getting better results how about do this mike how about when you're coaching a kid how about instead of teaching them just how to do it um uh, teach them why you're doing it like that you know like like when the when the ball's on the baseline we we want our guys in help position right uh you know why explain to me why explain to me why when the go when the ball goes on the baseline we want to get further to closer to the ball really in theory when the ball's up top two passes away we only got one foot in the lane why okay when the ball goes down the baseline we want to be straddling the midpoint in the lane why instead of just teaching them how this is where you stand son stand here when the ball is there why don't you explain why you're standing there and explain not just how, but why. And I, do, I think, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, did you, did you, when you were coaching, did you use a lot of questions to your kids? So like uh, just the example that you just gave. So if you say, okay, we're, you know, we want you to be in help side and straddling the midpoint here. And then would you turn to the players and go, well, why do we want to be here? Cause I well, found that when I was, when I was younger, I didn't do that. Like I would just be, you know, I would, I would be the lecture type coach where I'm just going to explain and this is what it is. And then I find now, and again, now I'm not coaching in high school anymore, but I'm coaching my kids and their, you know, their various grade levels. But I find myself coaching so much more today with questions where if we're going to do something, I'll say, okay, here's what we're going to do. And instead of me giving them the why, I turn to them and go, okay, why do you think we're doing this? And then hopefully the idea is that they process it a lot better when it's coming from them as opposed to it's coming from me. Absolutely. Ask them why. Ask it makes them think. It makes them think. And and we always talked about listen, if I'm asking a question, I'm asking it not just to Tommy, I'm asking it to everybody. And so if Tommy makes it has an answer, everybody better know that answer, if it's right or wrong. But no, absolutely. You gotta you know, I think you gotta ask them. I think they gotta be involved. I think if they know the answer, then then they're gonna do it. <laughs> they're gonna do it. They understand why. And so I, I just, uh, you know, well, why do you drag up the guy in the backside of a zone um, so we can throw it behind the zone to the short corner guy? Why? Well, because then he's the, the center's got to come out and play that, and then we'll just dive right there and just hit the dive guy um, from the medium post. All right, why? Because he's not, no longer there. And so it, you can be a dictator, and, and I've, I've done that, been there. But you can also dictate and then also ask questions. And um, it's much more important that they know what they're doing uh, and why they're doing it than they're just doing it because they're scared to death you're going to kill them if they're not on the midpoint. You know, and, and you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. I think the why. But also I think you become a better coach as you get older. Um, and, and you start understanding a little bit and you look back and you say, God Almighty! That's what that's what coaches need to do. The coaches need to continually to learn and to learn and take a summer and learn something and learn a new defense, learn a new offense. Um, don't be lazy. I, I made this comment. You want your players, coaches. You want your players in the gym working. All right, and you want them in the weight room working, and you want them getting better. I'm just curious. High school, college coaches, are you doing the same thing? Or are you doing the running the same offense that you've run for 24 years and you haven't you haven't improved anything? Are you working too, or are you just asking your players to work? Yeah, that's something that I can speak to uh, for myself. That I know when I was a younger coach, and you know I came out of college and got a job as a as a JV coach at a high school, and you know I thought I knew everything, and I spent very little time reading, going to clinics, doing any of that stuff because I kind of felt like, hey, I, you know, I already know what I'm doing. And now as a 48 year old guy, uh, I, I know that there's very little that I know. And so I spent a lot more, try, more a lot more time trying to learn and get better and improve and, and just grow as a, as a coach and as a person. And I wish I would have had that same perspective when I was younger. And I know 
to sort of segue into something that you're doing now with your 720 sports group, you guys have the academy. Can you talk a little bit about how that kind of plays into what we just talked about, about coaches growing themselves and learning? Yeah, I just I just want to really, you know, as I'm getting a little older, I, I want to help young guys and girls. I want to help young coaches. Um, I think coaching now is is bad. I, I don't think it's very good. I think there's some really good coaches. I just got done with four years of coaching in high school. Um, it ain't real good. Uh, there's no shot clock. Uh, people are just playing the game, and as soon as the game's over, they look at the scoreboard and see who won and lost. Nobody's trying to win. Nobody, you know. To me, I watch your team play for four minutes in a game. I should know your identity. I should know what you're trying to do offensively. I, I should know what you're trying to do defensively. Pe- people are just out there playing. I don't care if it's an AAU team. I don't care what. I need a good team has to have an identity. And so what we're just trying to do, I used to love going to clinics. Uh, I would I would try to take still something from from one guy and I'd steal two things from another guy. I used to love going to clinics. And if I, you know, I'm in the mode where I'm trying to help people now. I, I had a guy, at Alan LaForce, who was the head coach at East Tennessee State. He helped me. And, and it's time for, for older guys to kind of pay back the game a little bit and try to help other people. I had a lot of people help me. I could run the flex in 40 way, 48 different variations and ways uh, because I kind of learned that. I learned ball screen motion. I learned this. I learned that um, because I went to clinics and learned from everybody. And everybody used to share. Uh, very few people share right now. So I got enough good people down here at the academy. I got lucky. I mean, Seth Greenberg's a good friend. Fran Fischel is a good friend. Kermit Davis, at Old Miss, is a good friend. Everybody's shared. Rick Bird, good friend. Um, Bob Ritchie at Furman. Now, now I look like a genius having Bob Ritchie there. Um, everybody did a great job sharing what they do. It's not a secret, but share and try to help a coach and try to help a coach get better because in in turn you're helping a kid get better. That's all you're doing. Yeah, one of the things that I do think is pretty cool today that didn't exist 15 or 20 years ago is the fact that if you're, especially from a high school coaching standpoint, if you're a high school coach here in Ohio, you can be friends with a coach in California or be friends with a coach in Alabama or be friends with a coach in Iowa and get on the phone and kind of talk things through or you know have a group chat or whatever it might be that enables you to bounce ideas off your fellow coaches. And again, if you go back 15 or 20 years ago, everybody kind of existed and coached in their own little bubble. And maybe you talk to your coaching staff and maybe your spouse and that's about it. And now it seems like there's a much bigger community, at least in the high school ranks where guys are reaching out to other coaches at the high school level to be able to kind of help them through situations that, you know, Hey, this is what I'm facing. Have you ever had this happen to you? And then here's what I did and kind of bounce ideas off each other like that there's just there's no excuse now um, not to improve not to get better um, because you have access to everything <laughs> you have access if I want to learn a new a new D I you know I it's pretty cool you know I a coach may get in touch with me and say listen can you can you get me in touch with another guy I want to I want to learn more about his his 131 or or whatever he wants to learn about and so it's connecting people uh if you can't connect off social media something's wrong with you even an old guy like me can connect through social media um but there's no excuse not to get better there's no excuse not to get better and um but but i don't see that i just i don't see i don't see that happening a ton uh in certain areas of the country um i think guys are pretty hard-headed still at times so can you explain to people what exactly uh, who the market is for the academy and then when somebody would show up there, what is it that you're doing for them in that couple of days that they're participating? Well, what we did, what we did, and, and we're going to be doing a couple things in the in the spring and, and next summer is is the first I mean, it's in a very it's in a it's in an old warehouse that the guy who does the final four course and the logos for the final four course, that's where he does all of his work. So what we did was we took a back area of this warehouse and made the academy. So it's a very cozy little place. 
to go put 150 to 200 coaches in there. But what we did instead of getting so here comes uh, Seth Greenberg talk about man to man D. What we did instead of getting um, Covenant College or Bryan College or Chattanooga State Community College, instead of getting their players who are uninterested in being there, who are bored and don't want to be there for nine hours during the day, what we did was we bypassed that. So if I'm talking about man to man D, I got coaches up there. So I, I need I need four coaches. We're gonna we're gonna talk about some shell stuff. So I need four coaches. So we had four coaches come run up there, and, and they were the defenders. And it, it was a very interactive coaches clinic. Uh, and, and also, I didn't want – I didn't want I, – I would go to all those Nike coaches clinics, and, and I would hear – I would hear, um, you know, I'll pick on Bobby Crimmins because I love him. He's a good buddy of mine. But Coach Crimmins would tell jokes, and he'd talk about stuff for 35 minutes, and then he'd talk about – his topic for 10 minutes and I didn't get anything from it no one did and so we kind of did the opposite I said y'all can talk about yourselves for about 10 minutes and then let's really focus in for about an hour so so these coaches can get something out of it but we're going to do a we're going to do a women's coaches academy we're going to do trying to do a champions coaches academy um what I'd like to do is I'd like to get you know, one of my mentors is out on the force. He's 83 years old. He's still got a lot of wisdom. And and what we do is we get rid of all these old coaches and we forget about them. Um, I've been I've been a coach for a long time, and then I, I was out of coaching, and then they don't call you coach. Um, it, it it can be depressing. And so I want to. What I want to do is I want to get some of these old timey coaches and old timers out there doing it that's what i want you to do mike i want you to talk to some of these old guys on your podcast and get you know i did a podcast with with coach of force and i said you know if you had to do it again how would you do it different and get some of these old guys and their thoughts on the mistakes that they made that's how the old guys can give back to the to the younger generation yeah there's a huge i think market of guys out there who have been retired especially on the high school level uh, you just figure the sheer number of coaches that you know there are across the country who are retired and probably would be willing to share I think it's an interesting thought of you know how could you kind of organize that into a you know an old timers association for lack of a better word where those people could be resources especially now like we talked about earlier the ability to connect with somebody and again it doesn't have to be somebody in your geographic area anymore you can connect by you know the same way we're doing it tonight you just connect by skype or make a phone call or you know email whatever people are so much more accessible now than they ever were and it seems like that if you could tap into those retired coaches as a resource and put together some kind of a you know an organization based around that that seems like a, a tremendous resource for coaches at all levels well, here's what you got. Here's the difference. Here's what. Here's the difference between coaches and normal people. Because we're not normal people, Mike. I hate to tell you that. <laughs> we're, we're wackos. All right. All right. So, so if I'm in the if I'm in the business world, or I'm a doctor, or I'm this or I'm that, then that when it's time for me to retire, man, I'm going to the Bahamas. I've got my house down in Florida. I am chilling out. I am not dealing anything because those are jobs they did a job for 30 years or for 35 years um i don't think coaching's a job i think coaching is a calling and and i think that if you're in coaching for the right reason and you have a calling to be in coaching to help young people and to, to coach the game of basketball i think it's a it's a calling and what what happens is they don't want to retire they don't want to go to Florida. They want to talk basketball. <laughs> they want to watch a basketball game. They miss the game. They miss having a team. They miss being around the guys. And so I think that, that coaches are very strange people. And, and I think we're all a little wacky. Um, but I think it's, it's a difference between having a job and having a calling. And when you have a calling, you want to give back. When you have a job, you want to go to the Bahamas. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it gets if the game is in your blood, I don't think it ever leaves. And sometimes it takes different forms. And you know, sometimes you may 
you know, you may be coaching a team. Sometimes you may branch out and do different things like you're doing with your 720 sports group. And like we're doing here with the Hoop Heads podcast, it's all, you know, different slices of the same pie for lack of a better word. Um, you know, you're still involved in the game. It just, it, it's, it's in you. You want to talk about it. You want to share it. You want to just be a part of it and you want to be around other people who share that same passion with you. And that's, what's been so exciting for us on this end of the microphone is just getting a t- chance to talk to great people like you, John, and all the other guests we've had. It's just, I mean, we just have had so much fun with that. And I think anybody who's a coach feels that same way. Well, hopefully, hopefully what they got from this podcast is that I'm an idiot. No, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> that, that re- relation, I'm, I'm just going to tell you relationships as the coach part, you know, we, we've talked about a lot of stuff as uh, hopefully parents can get something out of it, you know, quit putting so much pressure on your kid and let you try to help your kid go to the right fit. But as the coaches part is, is relationships, um, relationships are the key and trying to help those young people whether it be guys or girls or it doesn't matter trying to help them because life's hard for those kids and i promise you you know your job is to win games absolutely but it's weird once you once you show those kids that you love them and you care for them they'll play so much harder for you and you'll end up winning in so many different ways whether it be on the scoreboard or not so hopefully we can give the coaches um, we can help coaches when I needed help. I needed somebody to grab me by the daggum um, shirt and, and the throat and say, hey, man, it, it ain't about winning and losing. It's about the relationships. Focus back on the relationship. Focus back on your why, and you'll end up being just fine. And I didn't have anybody to do that, so maybe we helped somebody tonight. Yeah, I think so. Let's ask one more. I'm gonna, I want to finish up with one last question. Uh, again, related to what you have going now is 720 Sports Group and what your why is for that, both why you started it, why you're doing what you're doing now, and maybe what you hope to accomplish with it in the future. And we can wrap it up there. It's, 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 it's a sports company that helps people, period. All right, so I've got a couple NBA agents that working with me that we are representing players and we're representing coaches. And we're trying to help young kids come from overseas so they can have the same experience that American kids can have and go play college basketball. And then the academy and then leadership academies. We got so much stuff going on, but it revolves around one thing to me. It revolves around helping people. And and if me and you didn't have somebody back in the day help us, we were screwed. And nowadays, it ain't. There's not a whole lot of people. We kind of. I think we live in a very selfish kind of world at this moment. And so, if we can help, if I didn't have Alan the Force, I'd have been a daggum JV basketball coach forever and ever, which would have been fine. But I got to live my dream. I, I was a head college Division One coach for nine years. We went to two NCAA tournaments. We barely got beat by Wake Forest beat us 14. UConn beat us by about 94 points. All right, and and uh, but but I got to live my dream, and I got to live my dream because other people helped me. And so if I can help other people, so so we're we're trying. I I love coaches. I love helping coaches. So you know whether I'm helping a coach go from be, being out of the game to an assistant at Emory and Henry to now an assistant at Gardner Webb. I like doing that because now he's getting a chance to live his dream because I had a very small part to do with it. I can't get guys jobs, but I can get guys in front of the right people and then they're going to have to get the job. But maybe I can help coach that coach how to interview and what he needs to wear, what he needs to do. And same thing with the player. Um, You know, players are weird. Players think they, 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 deserve something hey man you know the the greatest thing i saw was was they said that kd practiced like he was trying to make the team like he was still trying to make the team if you don't think you deserve something then you play harder so our whole 720 sports group is about helping people (laughs) involved with sports and and if we can do that then we've been a success yeah i I love that. I love the idea of you boil it down to a very simple principle that you're helping people 
to achieve their dreams. And, you know, obviously you're helping it through basketball. And it, I, I just think that it's tremendous. Before we get out of here, John, first of all, I want to say thank you to you for being willing to share your time with us tonight on the Hoop Heads podcast. And then secondly, I want to give you a chance to share out some contact information and social media so that people who listen tonight who want to reach out to you and find out more about what you're all about or have a conversation uh, are able to do that. Listen, I, I'm, I'm easy. All right. First of all, our, our, uh, our website is uh, www.720sportsgroup.com. And, and really, I'm just going to give everybody my email address. It's very simple. It's J Shulman, S-H-U-L-M-A-N, at 720sportsgroup.com. And I, I'm one of those. Okay, so we used to go to the Final Four. So I, the first couple of years I went to the Final Four, I went with Jeff Lebo. Jeff Lebo was the number one player in the country coming out of Carlisle, PA, in 84. He played at North Carolina. I did not want to go to the Final Four with Jeff Lebo because I was a really average player at University High in Johnson City, and I didn't want to go to the Final Four with a, with a superstar because I wasn't going to know anybody. Well, fast forward five years, um, I knew everybody because I was, as Jeff Lebo would say, he went, Shulman, you're the king of the Smos. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, you're the king of the little people. He said, and there's more little people than there are big people. So I figured this, if you're nice to everybody, it, it, it's a good thing and it'll come back and help you one day. So I'm the king of the little people. I, I was a JV basketball coach for four years and loved every dadgum second of it. And I was a head division one coach beating Tennessee at Tennessee, getting ready to play and being on CBS playing Wake Forest with LeBron sitting right behind our bench watching Chris Paul. I went from a JV head coach to coaching against Wake on CBS. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. And because I'm a very unintelligent human, but I coach with my heart. I live with my heart. And, and you know, that that's kind of who I am. So if anybody wants to email me, I will get back to you. Um, listen, I'm such an average guy. 423-667-8101. That's my cell number. Anybody can call me. John, we appreciate you sharing all that out. We're going to put that in the show notes so that people can reach out to you and have it after they listen to the podcast. I'll just repeat what I said a minute ago. I can't thank you enough for being gracious uh, and wanting to come on and, and share an hour and a half with us here on the podcast. We truly do appreciate it. Uh, I can speak to, we've now had two different conversations and your your thought process of being nice to everyone, I can certainly vouch for that being the case. Uh, if we go back three weeks ago, you and I didn't know each other at all. And now you've been willing to jump on here with Jason and I and, and share an hour and a half of your time to help us out and hopefully help our audience out with a lot of the great things that you were able to share tonight. So we truly appreciate it and just say thanks. Well, I appreciate it. Just on a side point, side note, it's a lot easier being nice to people than being mean to people. It's, you know, it's, it is. I say that at school almost every single yep. day. <laughs> I say that every it, day. I, I teach fourth graders. I say it all the time. It, I mean, it takes no effort to be nice to people. It takes effort to be mean to people. And so, uh, no, I appreciate it, guys, and appreciate what you guys are doing. You're trying to help people. So that's a good thing. And, Mike, me and you are going to hook up at Jay Bill's camp, and I can't wait to meet you. Absolutely. Uh, to everyone out there, we appreciate you listening, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Hello, Hoop Heads. This is Alan Stein, Jr. My new book, Raise Your Game, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best, will be available from all major book retailers on January 8th. Raise Your Game takes a rare peek behind the curtain and shows you what the top coaches and players in the game do during the unseen hours. I share their routines, rituals, and habits, as well as proven strategies that you can implement with your team immediately. If you want to maximize your coaching impact and influence, order your copy today at raiseyourgamebook.com. Head Start Basketball's Player Development Academy offers Cleveland area players a unique opportunity to improve their basketball skills. Regardless of a player's age, skill level, or position, training with Head Start Basketball will elevate your game to the next level. Do you want to improve your ball handling, become a better shooter, 
or develop into a more skilled, confident player, our academy classes offer training that's designed to do just that. Our training sessions are innovative and will have you learning skills that are transferable to actual games. We have four different class skill levels for boys and girls, ages four and up. All Player Development Academy classes will be held at the Strongsville Recreation Center. For more information or to get registered, please visit www.headstartbasketball.com. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, brought to you by Head Start Basketball.